Agronomist is brought to you by The Soybean School, The Sharp Edge, and Adama Canada. By listening to you and remaining unapologetically crop protection, we leverage the world's largest library of actives to provide innovative solutions to your greatest challenges. Tell your Adama sales rep what you're looking for today. Hi, everyone. I am your host, Lindsay Smith. Welcome to The Agronomist. Uh, thanks to everyone who's hopped into the chat uh, already. We, uh, Kevin, out in BC, they have started first cut silage. That just blows my mind. I'm just happy to have green grass at this point. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, Quick reminder, of course, if you collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomist tomorrow. Let us know you took in the program and we'll get you those credits. Tonight's conversation, sure to be a lively one. We have three guests tonight. Quick reminder before I bring them in, uh, next week's show is going to be on root rots. So um, super excited about that one. Okay, uh, we do have a question in the, the comments as well. Um, if you've got crop in, what have you got in? Um, I would say, and Warren, we're going to have a question for you, I'm sure, later on ultra early soybeans. So uh, there you go. Okay. Uh, Peter Johnson says it won't be that far here for first cut silage, some well advanced zero rye and triticale. That April heat sure did help. Okay. Let's get into tonight's discussion. We are talking about phosphorus and potassium management of soybeans. Joining me, Mr. Don Flayton, Horst Bonner, and Megan Burns. We've got an international cast today. We've got, we've got guests from America and Manitoba and here in Ontario. Okay, um, welcome all. Dawn, we'll start with you. Uh, recently retired. What's keeping you busy these days? Oh, you're muted. No, pause. There we I go. was waiting. I was waiting to hear from Horst, actually. But you no, know, I was. I, 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 I was. I've been surprised at how many people are interested in, um, you know, opinions about research and stuff like that. So I, I am fairly active on some research boards now, okay. and I get to um, get on the other side of the desk and and look at research proposals instead of writing them and stuff like that. Yeah. And then I, a few speaking events, and then some more time with family and friends, which is really important, of course. Yes. Yeah, I like it. That's a, I'm sure you have stories to tell. Um, all right. And Horst, um, we've got a couple questions that we'll get to in just a moment about those ultra early beans. But is anything going in around where you are in Ontario? Um, well, we're hoping by the middle to end of this week, we'll really get into it. Um, we had rain again last night. There's still some water standing in uh, the, the wet parts of the field. So it was a really wet week last week, but the forecast looks good. So, you know, we're about as ready as we're going to get here. We're ready to go. Yep. And now, Megan, we'll, we'll round this all up with a high note because you're, of course, in Kansas and yes. there are plants growing already. So, so where's the crop sure. at where you are? And Peter wants to know, are you in one of the drought areas? Uh, so starting with the crop, um, some of our corn has started to emerge, certainly. Um, so that's always super exciting to see the first few things out of the ground. Um, and our beans are just kind of going in now. Um, and as far as drought goes, I am not in the super drought affected areas. Um, pretty lucky not to be, though, because it looks pretty bad further west. Mm -hmm. They're really hoping for some substantial rain out that way. Mm -hmm. Now, Megan, have you ever met Don Flayton before? I feel oh, like yes. Don, Don, and I are, <laughs> Don and I are quite well acquainted. Yes, I am a, a survivor of his oh, graduate program. Don, yeah. that's yes. I figured we should just it's okay. I'm better that. for it. Better oh, there you go. Sure. Yes, yeah. Don was was your supervisor for uh, yeah. your master's project, right? Yeah, and working mm -hmm. on a PhD uh, at Kansas State. What is your PhD topic? Uh, actually, phosphorus fertility. So I'm looking at phosphorus Perfect. fertility in corn and soybean rotations. Okay, fantastic. Awesome. All right. So that's why we're all here. This is super exciting. Okay, Horst, uh, we're going to start with you uh, because as we go through this conversation, we're quickly going to um, we're going to figure out that phosphorus and potassium management can be a challenge because we don't always get the responses we think we should get. So. 
Horse, let's start with the Ontario uh, experience and some of the work that you're, you've done and that we work off of where we do get those responses to phosphorus and potassium. What do we need to know? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is one of those good news stories for us in terms of being able to use a predictive tool to know whether we will get a response. And of course, I'm talking about the soil test, right? Uh, and this is especially true for uh, potassium, but also true for phosphorus. We're pretty fortunate here on our soils. Um, you know, I've been doing soybean fertility trials for 20 years now, and it really is pretty straightforward for us. Um, they're, they're, it's, it's, it's basically, you know, um, if you're below a certain soil test, the likelihood of a, of a nice response increases greatly. And then as your soil test goes up, it very quickly goes to zero. But we do have a pretty good handle on the number in terms of bushels per acre you can expect. Because I think it, with today's prices, you know, um, it is helpful to actually have a number in terms of bushels per acre to try and calculate whether it's still worth it for you. Because often, you know, what you're getting at in terms of the response not being huge or zero, yeah, we see that too, for sure. Um, the other thing I'd say right off the bat is, you know, we've tried in furrow, we've tried pop-ups, starters, liquids, um, you know, banding, broadcast, or oh, a, a whole host of uh, nutrients in the package. And at the end of the day, really, it does come down to potassium mostly, phosphorus a little bit, and the other stuff is, is very much site-specific. That's where we're still at. So um, if just as an introduction here, and we'll go through this literally in a minute, if you put up the first slide there, this is some work that a few of us started a number of years ago, including Peter Johnson was in on this, Dr. David Hooker and Greg Stewart. And, and these are, uh, this is just one snapshot of that data on the soybean side um, where we applied um, in a two by two band in the spring, it says there are 180 pounds of 62828. It was actually a range there from 90 to 180. Anyway, the point is where the soil test was low, you can see right away a nice five bushel response. But then where the soil test on the right hand side there, where the soil test was adequate, uh, yeah, the more typical, huh, the more typical horse boner uh, approach of one bushel, right? <laughs> I mean, this is this is uh, and not statistically significant. Um, okay. And that's the reality, no matter what uh, approach in terms of placement, right? Now, if you go to the next slide, what is kind of cool, though, is that that difference between having put on the fertilizer in the spring um, to get to 56 versus having an adequate soil test, there still is a statistical difference. So. Mm -hmm. We were convinced that soybeans respond better to good soil fertility rather than added fertilizer. And that's what that extra three bushels uh, is, is telling you there. And we're actually um, starting again and really trying to put this together into some new Ontario fertilizer recommendations. We have a committee going, we have some researchers on board and we're, we're really working hard on on trying to pull this together and, and come up with the new, what our new recommendations are, because I feel that they're gonna be different from the old stuff that was based on 40 bushels. And today, you know, it's not uncommon for some of us to get 70 bushels. So mm. just go to the next slide. Um, and this is some work that I have done in the last couple of years to try and tease out whether it still is mostly a potash or uh, um, a combination of nutrients. And you can see there, we went from 60 to 63 with the potash, and then a little bit more once you added in all the other nutrients, but the majority of that response is still a potash response, right? Now, one final thought for you here. You know, I hit pretty hard on this soil test, um, uh, how good the soil test is, right, at the beginning. Yeah. If you look at the P and K for parts per million there, 18 and 134, we would consider those adequate. So, you know, I'm even surprised I managed to get that three bushels out of that potash. 
But if you go to the next slide here, what you'll notice is that now the P is about 12, getting close to a number where we, we, we feel really that you're likely to get a pretty good response. And the K at 98, you know, 100 is kind of that magic number that I use. And look at this, our Aspire number here went to six bushels, which is potash basically with a little bit of boron in there. So the point is now our response is doubled, right? from three to six bushels. So that's where we'll leave it as a starting place here. Our Ontario perspective is really that K is very important, but in my experience, P is part of, of, of that equation as well. And so to be honest with you, unless the P is through the roof, um, I often recommend having some phosphorus in with the potassium in terms of a uh, fertilizer blend. We, I personally rarely recommend just potash. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're buddies. So there's a, Peter's got a great question and we know that Pete's going to bring the great questions about soil type, which we're going to cover from all three of you, but just quickly, Don, there are different tests for phosphorus, soil tests for phosphorus, correct? Depending on where you are, do we use different ones? Yeah, there's a lot of varieties of soil tests, but there are similar soil tests, I think, for Ontario and Manitoba, because I imagine that Horst was talking about Olson or sodium bicarbonate mm -hmm. extractable phosphorus, and the data that I'll show will also be for Olson. So, okay. but but there's still some substantial differences in the soil, and and that's probably yeah. what's explaining what's going to explain the difference between. The responses that horse presented and the and the stuff that that megan and i will present right so this comes down to so I, I i like that we've set this up here that sort of background fertility is important but knowing those levels is really important so megan i'll, I'll go to you having done a master's then in manitoba ran research trials in manitoba maybe didn't get a lot of um or any responses let's put it that way so maybe if you can recap sort of what how that looked in manitoba and we'll dig into some of the soil differences as to why yeah sure so i think um if you could put up my slide four um i would love for people to get a handle on just how jealous i am about those nice responses to k um and soil tests being a good predictor of where uh um soybeans are going to respond so what we're looking at here is three different uh, figures from different scales that Don and I did our potassium uh, research at. So we have traditional small plot trials, we've got field scale strip trials, and then those micro plots are just uh, from small microsite sampling within the field scale trials. So trying to get at some of that variability that we know exists in, in the soils we were working with when we have uh, potassium questions. Um, and what you'll notice is that there is no good relationship um, in any of these uh, three scales between our ammonium acetate soil test K and our relative yield. So in our case, in the soils that we were working with in Manitoba um, in 2017 and 2018, which were both dry years, which is probably a, a part of this puzzle as well. Um, but the ammonium acetate really wasn't working very well at all to predict where we were going to see a yield response. Um, and we only had yield response at a couple of our on-farm trials um, and they didn't really uh, follow what we would expect either in terms of ammonium acetate predicting responsiveness so right so jealousy horst jealousy yeah i guess uh, it's, interesting it's, thing. it's pretty it's pretty tough looking at those results knowing what to do with that right i mean uh, yeah. you basically yeah. conclude nothing uh we don't know anything <laughs> <laughs> well, that that is exactly how I felt when I got to the first stage of my master's. Oh no! And that's why we added another study. So I don't know if we want to jump right to this, but if we go to the last, uh, my slide six. So we got through the first season, 20, 2017, and and we thought for sure we were going to see potassium response. We had deficiency symptoms showing up in our control plots and our unfertilized border areas. We had selected for low K sites or what we would classify as low K sites. We were confident. And mm -hmm. in our small plot trials, we got no significant yield difference at all, which just blew us away. Um, and so the question is, you know, why? What's going on? So something we did, this is very kind of preliminary data. Um, this is just from three, uh, three trials all conducted in 2018. Um, but we basically said, let's take barley, which is a crop that's known to respond pretty well in Manitoba to potassium fertilization on low K soils. 
and let's grow it side by side with our soybean at these low K sites and see if we get a, a crop response to, to K fertilization in either crop or neither crop. And uh, as you can see in the figure there, our soybean once again did not respond to that K fertilizer that we applied, but the barley that was grown right beside it at these three locations had about a 20% seed yield increase with K fertilization. So this leads us to think that there's probably something crop specific going on with the soybean that it's just really good at accessing those soil nutrients um, in some way that I cannot yet describe, but someone should definitely research at some point. <laughs> Well, you know, this show, I've started a list of all the projects we would like to have done. Yeah. So we'll add that one to the list. That's a great okay. idea, Megan. Okay. <laughs> so let's, this yeah. is fascinating. So let's dig in. Oh yeah. Horst, go ahead. Well, I mean, it's an obvious observation here, but I can't help but notice that you're talking about a 25 uh, bushel yield in soybeans there, right? And uh, mm -hmm. I, I was talking about a 50 bushel, sometimes 60 bushel. Yeah. I think that may be part of part of the explanation too, right? That it's pretty easy to grow a 30 bushel crop of beans without any fertilizer. It might not be so easy to grow a hundred bushel beans, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. I, so, I think it's important to note though, that the, the only soils which we can find in Manitoba that are below a hundred PPM K are really, really sandy soils. And so um, in that particular year with quite a bit of uh, drought stress, the yield potential was quite a bit lower on those particular soils that just happened to be K deficient. They just were the sandiest soils around, that we could find around. Just making sure that we got really, really low soil test K. We also got very drought prone soils mm. with our with our mm. climate here. But mm. I we we... I think we would certainly agree with your point that without the higher yield potential, you don't have as much demand for, for P or K. So, yeah, or something else is limiting, right? That's that's yeah. the key. What what water. is limiting right. that crop? Yeah. Water. water is limiting here for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, we only had. Water. Yeah, we only had I think between like about forty eight and seventy percent of like long term normal precipitation um, across all my small pot sites. So. Of course, if your moisture is not there, then it doesn't matter yeah. how much nutrient you put on. It's not going to make much of a difference at all. Mm -hmm. um, but I still think it's interesting that we saw those visual deficiency symptoms. And then all of that mm -hmm. difference just went away by the time it came yeah. to to harvest. Yeah. But of course, that could wow. be a decline in our yield potential as our moisture just dries up. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and that's still a, a low yield of barley um, for yeah. this yeah. region as well. But the barley response responded. So. I, I still think that there's quite a difference in crop species mm. interaction with mm -hmm. our soils and our case supply. So, okay, so let's dig in a little bit onto, so, and Peter asked this question about soil type and that critical soil test level. And Horst, we'll frame it first for Ontario, but then I want to expand it out of that as well. So is there a response different difference based on soil type that you can correlate or is it not that firm? Well, I, I, I struggle with answering the question because I'm not sure that we have the data. I think academically we could come up with all kinds of stories. Um, yeah. But my problem is that soybeans are, um, well, they're liars, right? I mean, they, they, they play tricks on you. So mm -hmm. I, I'd, I'd be more comfortable in hearing Don's answer to that question, right? I mean, obviously, you know, if – a sand is very different than a clay that holds a lot of nutrients, right? But then you get the the moisture component on top. I don't know. I'd like to hear Don's answer. Well, I I think I think that that soybeans are are, are tricky with respect to their their nutrient uh, acquisition. I think that they're more. We've got evidence that they're more aggressive at taking up uh, nutrients like phosphorus. We don't have much. Uh, idea about what's going on with potassium but we we do have evidence that they're much more aggressive than any other crop that mm. we grow in terms of accessing phosphorus from the soil so they're not as dependent on the fertilizer in our environment but but you're right if we had potassium deficiency in our clay soils which we don't mm -hmm. uh, then we might have a better chance of observing um you know k response but but like i say out out in western canada in general 
we we can only find potassium deficiency on really really sandy soils are mm -hmm. just a difference in our in our soil mineralogy i think yeah mm -hmm. and megan now how different is going from manitoba and heavy clays and rich soils what what is what is running a trial like in kansas what differences yeah, do you see there it's pretty different down here, but I think the biggest difference really strikes me in our, the way that we apply, like there's a lot of surface broadcasting that goes on here, which mm -hmm. just is very bizarre to me as a Manitoba agronomist. Um, mm -hmm. But um, that's one, one big difference. And around here, um, a lot of the soils, I think out of about 17 locations that I have trials at this season, just one of them requires potassium, for example. So um, we don't have quite the heavy clays necessarily, except in the very uh, south uh, east corner of the state. Um, but we still have a good uh, potassium supply. And I think that's one of the things that makes potassium nutrition pretty tricky. Um, and, and some of that work uh, that John Brecker and Dave Franzen did at NDSU showed that too. Yeah. Depending on how you treat your soil sample, if it's dried or, or moist, when it gets sent to the lab, that can affect, you know, the ammonium acetate K result that you get back and things like that. So it is a tricky, a tricky nutrient to manage for a few different reasons, I think, with particular respect to soybean, especially. Yeah, especially. Okay, this is a great little pause. I'm just going to quickly throw to uh, our second show sponsor of the night. And then we've got a couple of really great questions that have come through the chat. So Jay, if you will. Our sponsors for The Agronomist are Adama Canada, The Sharp Edge, and The Soybean School. The Soybean School on Real Agriculture is an agronomy and issues video series that allows soybean growers to learn on their own time, at their own pace, in order to become better growers in the long term. The Soybean School is made possible by support from Syngenta Canada, Pride Seeds, and BASF. Learn more at soybeanschool.com. I just love that jam. Okay. Uh, all right. Great question from uh, Canadian cowman. That's Kevin out in BC. So dairy farmer, lots of manure in the rotation, high FOSS soil test. Is there a negative to having zero FOSS in the starter? Don, you are the FOSS guy and the manure guy. So thinking of beans is there a negative to zero phos with that high background well um i don't really know for that one because we we conducted um 28 trials with soybeans and phosphorus fertilizer in different placements starter uh in the seed row near the seed row broadcast at three different rates in addition to the check and we got only one response at 28 sites. And wow. so um, we had we had uh, 14 sites less than 10 ppm Olson P. We had um, six sites with less than five ppm Olson P. And we only got one response to phosphate fertilizer. And it didn't really matter in that particular site, which happened to be soybean recropped onto land that had grown soybean the year before and and it it didn't matter how the the phosphate was applied whether it was a starter near the seed row or whether it was broadcast the the response was was the same regardless of, of placement so um going on only one site here with a p response i really can't comment on starter that, that I'd love to make all sorts of, uh, you know, great pronouncements on the basis of, of one positive response out of 28, but it's, it's, it's not sufficient information to work with. But I, I would say that um, in general, uh, we like to see some phosphate in starter fertilizer. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not as harmful to the seed in terms of toxicity risk as nitrogen or potassium. So I think it's it's probably one of the more common um, nutrients we'd like to see in starter for those reasons. Mm -hmm. Now, so Horst, what about uh, the experience here in Ontario? Is there a difference? Do we see a difference with phosphorus starter? Well, so 
I, I'm assuming we're talking about a dry in a two by two band uh, product here when he says that, right? Because we, we wouldn't be putting any potash in furl. That's too hot. Don't hit on that. We've tried that even very low rates. It's bad news. So as a general recommendation, we just say no potash in furl. So if he's talking about a two by two band, then um, my guess is with manure on there, his potassium level is quite reasonable as well. So my prediction would be that he will get exactly zero bushels per acre to a starter anyway. Now, if he's convinced that he wants to do it and he's going to go because he's going early or maybe his potash is a little low in some places, then absolutely I would put one third of phosphorus with that straight potash in a two by two band only though right and never more than half of crop removal in that scenario that's lots and you still won't make any money doing that uh he kevin does share that it's his soil test is 200 parts per million oh good night yeah no stop ben. Don't, <laughs> uh, don't do anything send send Manure. send the government a check instead like don't do that <laughs> there you go yeah, no, send, I, and, and Go ahead. There How do you draw that studies. down? Well, I was just going to say that there was a comprehensive study conducted by the Alberta government 20 years ago to look at, at soil test thresholds at which there's virtually no chance of getting a response. And, and basically, anything above 70 or 80 parts per million Olson P has virtually no chance of a, of a mm. P response. Um, our threshold for very high is anything above 20, but certainly... 200 is through the roof and there's probably no uh, agronomic um, or economic reason to apply any phosphate fertilizer. I, I have to say, Kevin, I feel like you need to find more fields to spread on and spread the love because you got Warren asking for some, but he's too far to send it to. So you've, you know, you just gotta, you gotta share that dairy manure love. Okay share your phosphorus share that p um uh, okay so a few other ones uh ray ray debanco wants to know are soybeans similar to flax with p acquisition don do you know what he means by that meaning that they're like like soybeans are aggressive as far as extracting um, from the soil if we can actually take a look at my fourth slide if jake could put it up we actually have that comparison and um this is work conducted almost 50 years ago in in growth chamber studies in Manitoba with radioactively labeled phosphorus and looking at the uptake of fertilizer phosphorus in the left hand figure. And you can see that soybeans rape, which is what canola was at that time, oats and yeah. flax all have similar responses during the growing season. But soybeans outshine flax, oats, and canola in the second figure on the right-hand side. It shows the uptake of soil phosphorus. And that soybean crop is taking up like twice as much, more than twice as much soil phosphorus compared to all the other crops. Mm. And, and so even though flax is mycorrhizal and canola is not, and oats is pretty decent as a cereal crop and taking up soil phosphorus those three crops are relatively similar the oddball in there is soybeans very very aggressive at taking up phosphorus and it's it's mycorrhizal like flax but it i think it has other sorts of um characteristics that it that allow its roots to take up phosphorus in large amounts in our soils i don't think it maybe would be the same case in in um soils with a neutral or acidic ph but in in what is there typically a high ph manitoba soils soybeans are are much more effective than other crops at taking up phosphorus from the soil mm -hmm. that's why they don't care about our phosphate fertilizer trials <laughs> should we be taking it personally don they don't care yeah, Megan, do. are, you, are you personally <laughs> offended that they don't care about your trials now don i think you win for oldest uh study to pull a slide from 19 i'm an old guy That's pretty good <laughs> i'm an old guy i like old studies <laughs> hey if the data's still good it's still good um uh, all right okay so there's some good questions this does bring me to uh let's talk about cation exchange capacity so peter wants to dig in a bit more about differences in clays so certainly 
we've got, you know, some very heavy clays in Ontario. We've got some clays. Um, Megan, I don't think you, you've got some. So do we see significant differences? So where's this question here in? I think it's split into, for some reason, this is happening tonight. Uh, people are hitting um, and enter too quickly and splitting their questions. Uh, where did it go? There. Does CEC matter to potash? So specifically to K, uh, are the clays that much different, Ontario to Manitoba? Manitoba is special, Pete. That's what you should know. Horse, though, I'll start with you. Um, as far as clays go, does it matter? Does the CEC matter to, to potash? Well, to be honest with you, I've stopped looking at CEC um, when it comes to our soil test. Parts per million does a really good job. Yeah, honestly, it's not that complicated. Um, I, I do not think that that with soybeans I'm talking about now, because the response is often zero anyway, right? And really, we're looking, we're talking about those sites that are low for in parts per million, right? That are more likely to have a response. So personally, I'm not hung up on it. I'd like to hear from the other two on what they think. Mm -hmm. Megan, maybe I'll go to you. Do you ignore CEC? I don't know that I ignore it, but maybe that's just because I'm young and not quite as wise yet. Um, but I don't necessarily factor it in in a major way to my K recommendations um, that I would make. Um, I think a lot of the difference, um, at least in what we were seeing, and this is this is a wild conjecture, I apologize, Don, but um, I think a lot of the difference that we might have been seeing was actually due to the, the K that's in between the layers um, in the clay mm. fraction in the sands that we were working with. Um, and I think that my hypothesis anyways would be that the soybean can somehow access that um, potassium. Um, so CEC wasn't really a big conversation for us in the in the very sandy soils that we were working with, but I'll let Don expand on that if he has thoughts, and I'm sure he does. Yeah, I think you're on the right track. And and we, we know that the work in Minnesota and North Dakota is revealing quite a difference in K behavior for mm -hmm. soils with different types of minerals than soils with other kinds of minerals. So the differences in mm -hmm. mineralogy are more important maybe than the differences in straight cation exchange capacity because some of the soils seem to have reserves of K that some crops can access that don't show up in the cation exchange uh, sort of tests that we've got. And in other cases, it's the other way around that those mm. soils are trapping potassium because they have the type of minerals that, that so-called fix or retain that potassium mm -hmm. strongly. So I think mineralogy makes a difference. And I don't pay any direct attention to CEC. The one sort of um, indirect effect of CEC is, is in some of our soils, which are potassium deficient, they are so sandy, their CEC mm -hmm. is so low that you'll yeah. never really build them up to high to levels of K yeah. fertility because they just simply can't hold that K, their their right. their K holding capacity, their cation exchange capacity is so limited. And so you could put on a ton of potash if you wanted, but it's not gonna stick around. Right. Uh, Warren's got a great question here, Warren Schneckenberger. And Megan, you mentioned the broadcasting thing. I too have witnessed the difference because I come from Manitoba and I came to Ontario and we love our broadcasters here. Right, Horst? We love us some broadcasting. Um, oh not God. me personally. <laughs> yeah, Don, I know. Don, you taught me well. I don't love the mm -hmm. broadcasting, but it is very common here. And so Warren's got a question. So Warren, I'm going to assume you mean P and K, but maybe you just mean K. So Warren, if you can, so Farmer Schneck, if you can... Uh, just clarify for me, but the question is, is there an advantage to broadcasting fertilizer on corn stalks in the fall versus in the spring ahead of beans? This is in a no-till program, no incorporation with tillage. So we're just driving out there willy-nilly, just spreading it everywhere. Dawn, just cover your ears. Um, I'm going to imagine that's P and K, is it? But uh, hang on, let's see if we got our do 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 Yes, P and K. Horst, is there an sure. advantage? So um, the quick answer is no. If, if, if that field is going to respond to either P or K, 
um, you can broadcast that on May 1st. You can even broadcast that on June 1st if it rains after. Incredibly, you will get a nice response. If the soil test is reasonable, um, you will not see a response no matter when you put it on. So, yes, of course, you know, only a certain percentage is available right away. Um, it's fascinating, though, you know, about 80% of soybean roots are in the top two or three inches, three inches anyway, right? And so they're incredibly good at picking up those nutrients, even if they just get a little bit of moisture, right? And that's why we have such a hard time. We've tried to tease out the banding versus broadcast question. And the reason we broadcast here is because it absolutely works. It's just as good as banding. Um, there's nothing wrong with it uh, other than the environmental concerns. I understand that. But from a soybean perspective, no problem with broadcast giver. Absolutely no problem. Right. So, it, yeah, so to the crop, there's no problem to there there are other considerations of course Fair enough. Fair uh, enough. for for the crop so as an agronomic practice not necessarily a concern as far as the results go um but i'm just saying for the record there are other considerations don yeah, no, 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 sure. yeah. yeah does that make you want to rock and plug your ears no i i i <laughs> i've recovered um, but I, I, I do want to, uh, but I'm not sure that Megan has because she did all these tests with rates and placements on potassium fertilization, including like the broadcast and the and the banded and all these other comparisons. Of course, didn't end up with any responses, so we couldn't really yeah. compare the placements. But I think the general consensus is that that broadcasting works fine agronomically and, to be honest, environmentally for K. It's when we start look, looking at broadcast phosphorus that we start mm -hmm. to get very concerned because your your losses are are much greater if you broadcast phosphorus as opposed to place it under the surface. But I do think that. Um, the the important thing to remember is that the the just like horse said it's the, it's the potassium fertility in your soil that's really really important and and the, you've got to have something there for the roots and by the way um make in Megan's studies she did measure with um these these cation exchange probes uh mm -hmm. it, the increase in supply of k it, it wasn't as if her fertilizer didn't work. <laughs> the, the fertilizer worked very well across the yeah. studies in raising right. the, the flow of nutrients in the soil, but the soybeans didn't respond to that increase in supply, but the supply was there. So Lindsay, on that point, if we could put yeah. up my last slide, I think it's helpful to try to get a handle a little bit on why sometimes we see a response and sometimes we don't. This is from some of our high yield um, work and you can see there treatment number two intensive there was a whole bunch of fertilizer we tried to cover the bases right with P and K and some of the other uh, secondary nutrients and you can see that uh, treatment one and two the control and the intensive no response like what is going on like what are you talking about Bonner here we go you got nothing right well look at the next one where it was irrigated 13 times, we got a 23 bushel response, right? And that was not the same with just water, because we've done that at that site previously and show nowhere near that. And then, you know, uh, you can you, you can go even further, we got a 33 bushel response if we went to uh, a soilless less pot mix and then we had some disease but theoretically we we got over a hundred bushels there so anyway I'm, I'm i'm hitting back on this this idea that i i don't want anyone to think here that at least for me that i'm against fertilizing soybeans i'm absolutely all for it. i think that's how we're going to get to these big yields we need to fertilize soybeans the problem is the response is highly dependent on moisture, right? And that's, are you getting that nutrient into that, into that soil solution so the plant can take it up? And I think that this helps to explain sometimes why we see no response. If there's not enough moisture in the soil, you're not gonna be able to pick, pick it up enough. That's my theory anyway. 
Okay, I want to pause there for just a moment because I've got a few last questions uh, that I want to cover, but we, we're going to go, Jay, if we could go to our last thank you for uh, tonight's sponsors. We'll come back for the last bit of the show here. Uh, I've got a few last questions for our guests. Thank you to all our show sponsors, Adama Canada, The Soybean School, and The Sharp Edge. The Sharp Edge on realagriculture.com looks to farmers, agronomists, and researchers to give them leading info on everything from agronomic problem solving to increasing profitability. The Sharp Edge is made possible by support from Mazex. Learn more at realagriculture.com. Jams. Okay, so with the last little bit of time we have here, uh, there's a few things I want to bring together. First, though, Megan, I want to go back to this CEC and the the calcul the probe to actually measure nutrient flow. Did you do that after you weren't seeing responses? Like, was that like year two, or was that part of the project from the get go? That's a good question. It was part of the project from uh, from the jump. Um, we just did it in select treatments in our study, if I remember correctly. Um, but of course we have the control in there and then I believe we had maybe a 60 pounds of K2O per acre treatment and 120 or something like that. It's sort of get, getting the range of rates that we were looking at. Um, and like Don said, so we were using the, the plant root simulator probes um, in situ, so in the field, um, and looking at uh, if we could pick up on differences in that supply of, of potassium uh, where we had our fertilizer treatments and, and we sure could, but like Don said, the, the soybeans just didn't, it didn't matter. Um, and whether that was a result of it being dry and low yield potential or the soybeans were accessing you know, different pools of potassium in the soil and just didn't need to rely on that fertilizer. Um, I don't have a good answer there, but it could be could be any of those things. All right. So so there's one thing that I want to sort of tackle. And then there's there are some good questions. We haven't really this show is all about P and K, but I do want to touch on sulfur just briefly, but in a moment first, though, or where I'm, I sort of start to bring some of this together is horse the work clearly shows that you know adequate levels in the soil soybeans do better and in fact plus as you mentioned or as that one showed that one graph showed you've got that three bushel response really just to having the adequate background there we've got megan from your work we've got barley that shows the response in the same year so i've always sort of thought about phosphorus and, and potassium management of soybeans as the long game Right. In that you're you're building over time and and sort of managing it, not in the season you're growing the beans, but in the other seasons. So if you could, I'll, I'll put this question to each of you in how you approach sort of. Yes, you're growing soybeans this particular year, but how do you sort of broach the P and K in the other years as well? Uh, Megan, maybe I'll start with you and we'll work our way across. Sure. Yeah. So uh, so I think for for our situation in Manitoba anyways, um, I think we can look at it positively. Our soybeans might not respond to that fertilizer application in the year that we're applying it, um, but we have the flexibility then to manage our P and K rotationally. Um, so I think it's really important to make sure that we are looking at balancing our P and K you know, inputs and exports from the system across our crop rotation. Because as we've touched on today, soybeans do use their a hog for nutrients. Like they require a lot of P and a lot of K relative to our other crops. So we know that they're using it um, and we want to make sure that we're, you know, not depleting nutrient uh, supplies for the other crops in our rotation um, and we're not missing out on an opportunity to have, uh, you know, really good yield if we've got good moisture conditions, etc. So from my perspective, I think it's important to make sure we're managing it across the rotation and we have the flexibility to do that um, in, in the case where soybean doesn't necessarily respond uh, in the year of application. Horst? Yeah, I, I, I think the evidence is, is very clear that if your soil test is built, you can put the fertilizer on any time in the rotation. Uh, you can put it on for the soybeans or probably uh, it's smarter to put it on for the corn after the, the winter wheat is off, especially if you have that in the rotation. Um, but again, I think we can't overlook the fact that if the soil test is slipping, there's a five bushel response there right uh, that's what i showed in that first slide so um i think there's great flexibility so you can do whatever works for you there is no good evidence that you have to apply the fertilizer to soybeans directly um, in fact i would say that the, the evidence is pretty clear that you can put it on in the other crops and 
and and you're you're fine. Mm -hmm. Don, I I agree with everything that uh, Horst and Megan have said, and the the only thing that I would add is that Megan is being a little modest because she's actually looking at some of these issues in her PhD down at Kansas State, and and looking at 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 bigger long term sort of questions about mm -hmm. pea fertility, for example, and mm -hmm. and. And so those bigger long-term questions matter to people who, who have that bigger long-term vision. And, but there's a group of people, old farts like me, that if you're getting set to retire on your farm, you can leave it up to Junior to look after mm -hmm. all these long-term fertility issues. And you can start packing the money away for a nice trip to Hawaii or something like that. So there is that, there's just that retirement strategy in there as well to consider. Mm -hmm. That's my old guy's perspective. But seriously, the, the, the rotational strategy is the way to go. And soybeans give you more flexibility than other crops at, out yeah. here anyways. And so if, if you've got high fertilizer prices and or you've got some other issues mm -hmm. to deal with in terms of cash flow or anything like, like that, you can, you can maybe take a year off, but it's not going to last. It's not going to last. Right. Yeah. Um, some good questions here. And, and Warren follows up. So on that, that point of banding broadcast, um, Warren shares, of course, that, that he keeps coming back to broadcasting ahead of the beans. It's cheap, it's easy, it's fast, um, and it keeps winning on the economic side. So uh, to your point, Don, of course, you're right, you can draw down these levels, uh, but you are going to draw them down over time. Yeah. And the retirement window, but there's also the rental windows so that's the other question is are you renting this land or are you owning this land um and i would argue even if you're renting it you you obviously don't want to be mining it um so keep that in mind as well and as a landowner you wouldn't want your uh renters to be mining it but you could if uh if you made that choice so there you go as peter says i, I might be an old guy don he is he's very old uh but i'm still not willing to <laughs> mine my soil uh so there you go okay so now we've got a couple we'll do a few rapid fire questions here because there's some great ones coming in uh quickly everyone uh in the comments we've got about 10 minutes left so if you've got any specific questions for our guests please ask them uh ken asks are beans and peas interchangeable in their response to p and k Horst, I don't know how many pea fields you've walked, um, but if you have an opinion on this, I'm glad to hear it. Don, uh, we there are some peas in Manitoba, not as many as there used to be. Uh, what do we know about P and K with our pea crop? Uh, I'll leave it to the others. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds good, Horst. That's okay. Yeah. There, there, there has been quite a bit of research in Saskatchewan and Alberta on at least uh, phosphorus responses to uh, in, 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 in field peas, for example. But generally, I would say that those responses are less frequent than in, in other crops, but they're still there. And so work that was done by Ross McKenzie with Alberta Agriculture yep. uh, quite a few years ago certainly demonstrated that there was value in, in fertilizing peas. But you've got to be really, really careful with peas uh, and soybeans for that matter, because they are sensitive to excess fertilizer in the seed row. So, you know, you've got to have the right uh, the right placement so that you don't burn the seed. Okay. Um, and, Me well, Megan, do you have any experience with, with pea fields? I have very little yeah. except I eat pods. <laughs> when I worked with uh, MPSG running their on-farm research program for a couple of years, um, we did several pea trials and I think um, I would totally agree with what Don said. I think it's maybe a little more of a consideration than than for soybean. I don't think we want to just trust the peas to grow like we we can with soybean. It seems, but um, but I don't think response is necessarily uh, as frequent as in other crops. Okay, all right. Um, and good question here from Bill: Is there any response to broadcasting ammonium sulfate before beans? Horst, I'm putting that one to you first. So we have 13 site years now to that 100 pounds of ammonium sulfate applied in the spring. And our, our uh, response is 2.9 bushels per acre. The problem is where we apply just urea, we got 2.2 bushels, right? Uh, equivalent amount of nitrogen. And those are mostly in no-till. 
So there is a nice study underway now, Pioneer's involved, Mazex is involved, to try and answer the question around early planting and um, ammonium sulfate and some urea to really get the beans going. I have very little hope that it will be more than 2.3 or 2.9 bushels, right? Um, because we've already kind of done a lot of that work. So yes, there is a response. The answer is 2.9 bushels, and maybe maybe we can get it up a little higher if we do everything right and we plant the beans early, but um, that's the number, which is um, the typical soybean conundrum. There is a response, but not enough to really recommend you should do it, right? There. Okay, so I have, I have a few last questions. So Sean Haney is probably lurking here tonight. And we are talking about P and K. So apparently I have to ask about the K-State Wildcats, Megan. And oh, yeah. what are their chances this season? I do not know what sport they play. So we play a lot uh, of sports and we're pretty good at it. Oh, okay. <laughs> so do they have a good chance? I don't know. I, I, I'm going to say yes. And I'm going to say it confidently. Excellent. We absolutely okay. do. I so am can. super glad. I do. I think he sent me a GIF, and it looks like the colors are purple, which are pretty. Yes. So sometimes mm -hmm. that's how I cheer for teams, okay? Yep. Sportsing is very technical on this show. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, now, um, yes, so that we have to get that one in there for sure. And uh, no, Pete, Sean only cares about baseball. No, he also loves college football um, and college basketball. So there's that. We do, Horace, I did promise um that i would ask you because you were on this show a few months ago and you said you were you were prepping the planter that week and this oh, was yeah. it was full on winter and you were gonna go in the first window was there a window are there ultra early beans in the ground in your backyard oh, we're, all, we're all done Lindsay. we're all done we got our feet <laughs> up here it's all good we're just waiting for the beans to come up 100 <laughs> percent planted wall the wall beans. no unfortunately they're that we at our sites were not able to plant anything. The ground was almost fit and then it rained. Um, so like I said at the beginning here somewhere, we're hopeful to go this week. But personally, I, I have not been able to get any in. Uh, and this will be the first year in quite a few that I haven't planted in April some beans. Um, but, you know, it, we're not going to plant them in the mud. I mean, that's for that's for sure. So what are you going to do, right? So I will share, Warren, I hope you don't mind, that Warren did plant beans in the first window because we had a window. And I think they've even emerged. But it's going down to two degrees tonight. Um, so I hope it's warmer where you are, Warren. Oh, That's yeah. all I'm saying. <laughs> okay. Uh, so on that, though, Megan, so I'm, I'm going to guess that's less of a worry. What, and I'm always interested because there's still the... Um, still the whole should we go by 10 degrees horse do we have to wait till the soil is warm or do we go when the soil is fit so megan are there any rules of thumb you've already got baby plants growing which we're all jealous of but what is the trigger is it a calendar trigger is it a soil temp how do you decide in kansas when you start rolling so so i'm going to preface this by saying this is just my second season growing season here so i'm still learning but uh it seems like there's some soil temperature consideration for when you want to get your corn in and the beans that follow seem to be a calendar date thing. So get the corn yeah. in the ground and then and then get the beans in um, seems to be the way that that it goes. Um, and even though we don't have to worry as much about frosts, uh, the temperature swings are crazy here. So at like 2 p.m. Yeah. it's beach weather and 2 a.m. it's like two degrees Celsius. Um, right. And that goes on for for a few weeks in the spring. So we do still have to kind of consider that as we're as we're planting. But uh, but yeah, it seems to be more of a calendar date thing as far as I can tell so far. Okay, and Horst, do, should we care yeah. about the 10 degrees or no? No, no, throw your soil thermometer out. I threw mine out five years ago. It was the best thing I could ever have done. Uh, the only thing that matters is if you get a cold rain after. Uh, yep. You don't, the, the conditions within, uh, let's say a week after is, is really what matters. Um, the soil has to be fit, which I mean, it has to be dry enough, right? But soil temperature, no, I, honestly, I couldn't care less. Um, the soybeans are tougher than you think. And I mean, all this, I know this is always kind of an interesting conversation, but the older I get, the more I just think if I can get one window, 
before the 20th of May, I'll be really happy. <laughs> right? It just, I mean, we, it always rains, right? So it's a bit of an academic yeah. question for us uh, here, to be honest with you. We just hope it stops raining so we can plant. That's where yeah. we're at. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And Don doesn't have to worry about this anymore. You don't have trials no, to put in. You don't <laughs> None of these things. No, but I, but I have been thinking like our, our farmers have been held up by by snow uh, yep. more than rain yep. <laughs> in April. And so it's it's been a bit of a late start for our farmers here in Manitoba this spring. Not as late mm -hmm. as last year because it's yep. not as wet overall. And, and I think I think the whole province will be rolling f big time this week. But um, mm -hmm. it's I'm touching it, wood. Yeah, it, 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 it's it's when you when you can't and you can't haul your air seeder out of the snowbank, uh, it's a pretty strong disincentive. Yeah, and and Warren says that I'm way up north here that it's two degrees tonight. He's going to be five, so that's how far. Yes, way up north. Never mind. We've still got snow under the bales in some places out west. So there you go. Um, Pete says plant those soybeans in the snow, Don. Temperature doesn't matter. I don't think I agree with that. <laughs> Leave well, it to Peter to push it over the cliff. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, but, yeah. but he wants the soybeans to fail so that there's more wheat. Um, there you go. Yeah, no. No, we want the beans in early so we can get the wheat in. That's the that's what he's going for. I'm sure of it. Anyway, all right. Uh, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you to each of you uh, for being so generous with your time and your knowledge and for sending in your slides all on time like gold stars to each of you. It was really fantastic. <laughs> but this has been a fascinating conversation. Uh, thank you to everyone in the comments as well. Always makes uh, for a great discussion to have some great questions going on. Uh, thanks to our sponsors, Adama Canada, The Soybean School and The Sharp Edge. Don, Horst, Megan, thank you so much for the show tonight. This has been fantastic. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Cheers, everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs>